Hi, everyone. Um, thanks. Thanks so much for inviting me to join you this evening. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity. Um, I've been working on this project for quite a long time. Uh, so when Ian says you might have met me several years ago, you might have heard me talking about some of this several years ago. Um, uh, I kind of made the mistake, I think, at some stage of becoming an academic, which means that I spend an awful lot of time not doing research. Uh, and so I'm coming back to this project, um, having completed my PhD a couple years ago, and I'm in the process of thinking about uh, what I'd like it to be as a book and what more I'd like to do. And so in particular, I really value this opportunity to share the research with you and also to hear what you think about it, because um, it's going to help me a lot in terms of thinking about how to frame it going forward, what more I'd like to do. Um, all of those sorts of questions. Um, so I'm going to put my slides up. Um, I have a couple of slides because I have some quotes that I'm going to want to share. And I, I personally, I think that's probably not generally regarded as best practice, but I personally like to be able to see a quote kind of up on screen and read along and, you know, perhaps mull it over for a little while while the speaker continues. So that's how I've done my presentation. Um, so I'm going to share that now and then um, I'll start with a bit of an introduction. I want to start by saying that um, my project is a historical one. Uh, although I, I don't really consider myself a historian as such, uh, but it starts from the present. So I've spent some time working in cooperatives and trying to develop them. Uh, I was drawn to them in my early 20s as a way of organizing, resisting, and building alternatives to the depravities of the capitalist system, while also strengthening ourselves and our communities so that we would have the resources to keep resisting. Um, and that's very much this pla the place that this project comes from. Um, I admire cooperatives. Um, I want to spend time working on them. Um, uh, but as part of that early experience, I was struck by what seemed to be quite pervasive tensions uh, within co cooperative organizations, as well as within the wider cooperative movement. The first of these was a sort of political tension. I was involved with a particular co-op uh, while David Cameron was promoting the big society, which I'm sure everyone here will remember. He visited our cooperative, proclaiming it as an example of the big society in action. Uh, this was, of course, contentious within the cooperative, um, and I started to wonder how it, how it was uh, that cooperatives could so easily be painted as part of a program that seemed fundamentally antithetical to the aims of cooperation, or at least my understanding of those aims. This was accompanied by what appeared to be a, sort of a structural constraint. So Johnson Birchall put this well when he wrote that, quote, it seems we cannot have both efficiency and small scale democracy in the modern trading world. Either we stick to principle and go out of business or we become just like big business and have no principles left to stick to. Either way we lose. Of course, much of this and some of these tensions, I suppose, might be explained by the idea of the third way that nebulous space between states and markets, which at various points in time has captured the imagination of both left and right. However, the third way itself is a construct. The notion that there is a between state and market requires to some extent that we accept the state and market as givens. I think we need to look a bit deeper to understand how it is that cooperatives, which we invest with so much of our desire for change, are implicated and caught up within the broader capitalist system. The historian Stephen Neo suggests that cooperatives are inappropriately seen as functioning within a system which is, quote, their project to replace. However, while it may sometimes be their project to replace that system, they also inevitably do operate within it, and they have been shaped by this inclusion. So this project, broadly speaking, is about understanding some of the limitations that have been imposed on cooperatives, conceptually and legally, that we may sometimes take too easily for granted or simply accept as kind of condi conditions of existence. And so I take a critical and socio-legal approach to these questions. Uh, this is partially due to happenstance. When I started asking some of these questions, I was working on a research master's in law. So I took the opportunity to, to learn more about the legal, recognitions, the legal recognition of cooperatives more generally. However, as I came to understand, processes of law and legal recognition have played a significant role in shaping what we understand the cooperative to be in the first place, and what we accept as the parameters and constraints on their operation within a broader capitalist system. The basic argument that I've come to is that rather than being between state and market, cooperatives have been constituted through legal recognition by the state in order to compete on and be disciplined by the market. Um, and obviously there's so much more to cooperatives than that. I don't mean this to be a sort of reductive argument, but reflective of a particular sort of historical process that I'm gonna go into more detail about. And I also want to stress um, that I don't think that law is somehow completely determinative of how we imagine and practice cooperation. Um, in part, I've only focused on one way in which cooperatives have been legally recognized. Uh, 
And of course, it's never been a requirement to be an industrial province society in order to be a cooperative. Many cooperative organizations adopt um, a wide variety of legal forms as well. Um, and in addition, of course, many struggle with the uh, limitations and requirements imposed by law and bring incredibly diverse political aspirations and analyses to cooperative projects. Nonetheless, I think that there is something instructive about studying the process of legal recognition in some depth, particularly insofar as it sheds some light on the tensions, and in particular, the relationship between, between cooperation and the kind of capitalist market economy that I mentioned at the outset. And I think that this is because of a particular way that law was used and, our, and how our perception of law and regulation as a society changed in the early and mid 19th century. In short, and as I'll explain in more detail shortly, we came in the 19th century to understand legal recognition as a right, as opposed to a narrow privilege and potentially an unjust imposition of control. In addition, and this is the more sort of critical legal studies angle, uh, law and legal mechanisms have their own history and aspects of the legal form eventually granted to cooperatives, of course, extend back much further. Uh, in my work, I focus particularly on the notion of incorporation, which has its roots in the medieval church. Uh, I may touch on some of this later, though we're mostly going to stick with the 19th century in this lecture. So by way of an overview, just quickly, um, I'm going to start just by uh, talking about how law appears in histories of the cooperative movement generally, how it tends to be discussed. Then I'm going to go into a little bit more depth about the process of legal recognition in the 19th century uh, and the relationship between legal recognition and what I'm calling market discipline with a focus on the Christian socialists. Um, and then I'm going to conclude by looking at the legal form of incorporation itself and putting forward what I think uh, sort of an idea of how uh, legal recognition and incorporation creates a form of enclosure. Okay. So delving now into the history of the cooperative movement uh, and law, I want to uh, start with so what's been said about law in that context. And so just briefly, who, for those who may not already know, and I think you all probably already know, um, and I'll go into much more detail about this later, cooperatives gained formal legal recognition, formal legal recognition through the Industrial Provident, Provident Societies Act of 1852. Within histories of the cooperative movement, there's not been a great deal of focus on law and legal recognition. So if we go back to the 19th century, we find the Christian socialists themselves, of course, uh, largely responsible for securing this recognition and who we'll discuss in more detail soon, observing just 15 years after the fact that the legislation created for building societies and cooperatives, and here they're talking about um, the Benefit Building Societies Act of 1863 and the IPS Act of uh, 1852 respectively, were quote, anticipated by the spontaneous efforts of the working class. These forms of organization, according to them, were not the creature of parliament, but the working man's own creation. Skipping ahead somewhat, GDH Cole, in his Century of Cooperation, suggests that legal recognition met specific needs that cooperatives had, thereby allowing them to flourish. Cooperative societies, as Cole writes, were beset with legal disabilities, impediments to their operation that needed to be removed if they, if they were to be successful. He writes, quote, the difficulty was not that cooperative societies were under the ban of the courts, but rather that no special provision had been made for them, so that they were unable to enlist the positive protection of the law when it was needed either to secure them against fraudulent or negligent officials, or to enable them to carry on trade in such a way as to enter into firm contracts, to sue or be sued as collective bodies, or to enjoy any reasonable security of their funds. Further, these impediments were not, as Cole cautions, active restraints. He says, quote, cooperation never suffered under legal disabilities as severe as those which beset the trade unions. Moreover, quote, it must, not, it must not be thought that these disabilities were due in any considerable degree to a deliberate attempt to hamper the growth of the movement. Finally, uh, and much more recently, again, Stephen Neu has written that the passage of legislation seemed as it came to confirm their capacities rather than to deny them. Thus, it seemed transparent, rational, and progressive that large-scale cooperation was the future form, competition the past. And so while these accounts of legal recognition have some obvious differences, uh, they share a set of assumptions um, that I believe have led those who study this history to take legal recognition for granted as something that's generally positive and enabling, and that doesn't really require much scrutiny um, on its own. So in particular, the law in these accounts appears to be what we might say is technically neutral, 
It simply recognizes something that already exists, fully formed outside the law, and brings it within the law, giving it a form of legitimacy, but not really otherwise changing or adding anything to what working classes were already doing with cooperatives outside the law. A second assumption is that the law is something that is needed, that a lack of law creates particular disabilities, and legal recognition is something that's done in the name of equality. Further, there's an assumption that law and the state only oppress or control through active oppression and denial of legal rights. However, as I'll, as I'll argue later, the act of recognition itself is a way of imposing control and order. Uh, finally, there's an assumption that, the law, that law and legal recognition is inherently something progressive. And here I do think that there's actually some really important nuance in Stephen Neo's statement, which seems to imply that the law has some role in facilitating the large scale development of cooperatives and perhaps in selecting the way in which that might be done. So over the rest of the talk, I'll be offering a series of counter arguments to these accounts and particularly the understanding of law and legal recognition that informs them. So the legal recognition of cooperative societies I want to start by saying is not the story of a social movement struggling for recognition by the state. Instead, the legislation was in many respects the byproduct of a much wider debate about social reform and the role of capital in the market in society. While it was intended to promote the development of cooperative societies, these were imagined not simply as a means of improving the condition of working classes, but also facilitating their moral and political discipline by exposing them to the market. I'm gonna go into some detail now about the process through which legal recognition was gained, exploring some aspects of this wider context, while also, also focusing in on the motivations of the main group that promoted legal reform, uh, and that's the Christian socialists. So in the late 1840s, the Christian socialists were a relatively new and ultimately short-lived group of philanthropists and social reformers linked by their shared dismay at the miserable condition of, of working class labor and a vague, quote, common desire to somehow Christianize socialism and socialize Christianity. Notably, their group began to form on the day of the Chartist meeting at Kennington Common, partially motivated by an anxiety that disorder might ensue. While their views differed on whether or not working men should ever have the suffrage, which the Chartists of course demanded, they shared the notion that the capacity of the working classes must be improved for them to be capable of having those rights. As one of their founders, and arguably the most democratic amongst them, John Malcolm Ludlow writes in their first journal, Politics for the People, Quote, I long for universal suffrage. Suffrage, I long for the day when every man in England shall have the vote. And more than a vote, that is to say, when every man in England shall enjoy a share in the government of his country in the full proportion of his capacity and worth. And when every means shall be supplied by all his fellow men for the full development of his capacity, for the full perfecting of his worth. But I cannot claim the suffrage. I cannot claim any other privilege for those who are unworthy and incapable of exercising it so long as they are thus unworthy and incapable. So you get this really clear idea of the sense that the working classes may be entitled to it at some stage, but they're unworthy and incapable. So the sense that working people were unworthy of political rights and their character somehow needed to be improved pervades the conversation around the legal recognition of cooperatives. And so at first the Christian socialists didn't know how best to apply their principles, they didn't start out seeking to develop or encourage the development of cooperatives, and they focused their efforts on sanitation projects. However, some in the group that felt that this focus took them too far away from the working classes. It was then that James Lidlow, of course often cited as the founder of the Christian Socialists, returned from a trip to France where he had observed the success of self-governing workshops. He convinced the rest of the group the virtue of such associates, associations, which quote, were endeavoring to beat down competition by competition itself. The Christian, uh, the Christian socialist legal reform efforts, however, seem to have been motivated as much by a desire to protect their own investments in cooperative societies, which were prone to failure, of course, as they were to provide a legal basis for cooperation more generally. As Rob McQueen explains, quote, the more often cooperatives failed, the more strident became the voice of those in the Christian socialist camp, calling for the introduction of a measure that would allow such undertakings to assume the corp corporate status and the cloak of limited liability. Their focus on legal reform may also derive from the fact that several of the Christian socialists were lawyers, and Ludlow in particular specialized in company law. Though the process was led by the Christian socialists, cooperative societies at the time were not entirely silent on the question of legal reform. 
there was some interest in legal reform from the Northern societies as indicated by a conference held in Manchester in December of 1850, organized by the Christian socialists. At least 44 societies were represented at a similar conference held the following year. However, by the time these conferences were held, the Christian so socialists had already started the process of lobbying parliament. In spite of this interest, that the Christian socialists were working at somewhat of a remove from the immediate concerns of cooper cooperative societies is evidenced by the frequent admonitions of those societies in the pages of the Journal of Association, a periodical set up in part to chronicle their legal reform efforts. So they begin by reassuring societies that government is inclined to help them. Sorry, is this it? No, oh, not yet, sorry. They begin by reassuring societies that the government is inclined to help them, so much so that the government, quote, allowed this bill to be prepared by a member of our society, a lawyer, and a writer in this paper, one of your own friends, therefore. However, when the request for petitions to support the bill only received 12 responses, the tone palpably shifts. And then they say, quote, I tell you that the only reason your bill was not passed the last session was because most of you didn't show that you cared a straw about the matter. Working class cooperative societies are specifically scolded for their lack of forethought and for believing that they're getting on okay without the law. That working class cooperative societies were initially uninterested in legal reform, of course, complicates Cole's suggestion that cooperatives suffered under particular legal disabilities. While the legal position of cooperative societies was indeed precarious in a formal sense, the suggestion that they required a legal, a legal reform participates in the tendency to read the history of the cooperative movement in terms of what it would become and cast legal recognition as the, po the positive realization, sorry, the progressive realization of this outcome. This in turn, I think, obscures the way in which legal recognition served to constitute the cooperative and the disciplinary logic that motivated legal recognition. So further, the Christian socialist uh, remonstrations underscore their belief that the working classes were not yet ready for political rights, nor would they be unless they committed to the legal reform process the Christian socialists were leading. So again, in the Journal of Association, we have an example of this saying, then you'll all sing out loud enough, I'll warrant, you'll make your voices heard from John O'Groats to, land, to Land's End. There'll be public meetings, placards, and spouting matches, enough to deafen one. And your Ernest Joneses and the like, who shirk and carpet the movement now, will be thundering out sonorous sentences on class legislation, association persecuted in Parliament, cooperation not represented. Humbug, I don't believe that you would have so good a chance of getting this bill passed at once in a universal suffrage Parliament as you have in this present one. The government is with you and ready to do your work. Influential men in every party, except the ultra-free traders, have promised to support the bill. Why not a single member to whom we sent, who we went the last session, and we saw between us 30 or 40, refused to support you. You are represented for this purpose, and if you don't avail yourselves of this chance, I shall begin to think you don't deserve to be represented for any other. So basically saying, you know, <laughs> accept, accept what you've been offered, this form of economic rights, and if you don't want to accept this, you have no right to complain about anything else, and in particular, the franchise. So of course, um, and I've already mentioned this to some extent, the legal position of cooperative societies was indeed precarious prior to the passage of the Industrial and Provident Societies Act of 1852, and to some extent after that, particularly for middle class reformers to, who wished to invest in them. Before the first IPS Act, many societies operated without any explicit legal form, falling instead under the general laws of partnership. This status was made much more pr problematic by the passage of the Joint Stock Companies Act in 1844, which required partnerships with more than 25 people to register as companies. This was, of course, a problem for cooperative societies, not least because the shares in joint stock companies are transferable, meaning that a society could potentially be taken over by investors who did not share their values. Some societies had, of course, long been registering as friendly societies under the auspices of what was known as the Frugal Investment Clause, which allowed friendly societies to engage in trade with their own members. However, this status only allowed them to hold property tr through trustees, and they fell outside the protection of the law as soon as they traded with non-members. Moreover, none of these legal forums at this time offered limited liability. However, it was widely acknowledged uh, that limited liability was of negligible importance to the working classes themselves. As Ludlow admits, quote, the real safety of the members of our associations lay in this, that very few of them have had anything to lose. Nonetheless, limited liability became a central aspect of the debates over legal recognition of cooperatives. Um, and this is where I think we get into a much wider sort of social context as well. 
the Christian socialists had what was then considered quite a radical position on limited liability, advocating that it should be available for all forms of enterprise and not just for cooperative societies. In this position, they found themselves in the company of the staunchest supporters of political economy and laissez-faire. And so it's worth discussing limited liability in some detail, as the discussion around it helps to demonstrate where the legal recognition of cooperative sits within shifting views about the market in the 19th century. So limited liability was, of course, a notoriously controversial issue. In the early 19th century, approaches to the morality of the market were dominated by evangelism, particularly associated with Thomas Chalmers. In the, event, in the evangelical view, the market functioned in a retributive fashion, Failure to conform to the demands of the market, which required a, a particular form of moral restraint, led to failure as a form of punishment. And in turn, hard work was to be rewarded. So in order for this retributive mechanism to work, investor investors needed to bear the full responsibility of their actions. Consequently, there was a reluctance to adopt regulatory measures that would provide protection in the event of business failure, such as limited liability. The shift in attitude away from the retributive evangelical view was precipitated by a range of factors. However, I think the most important of these for our purposes is that as more people from the middle classes began to invest, it was difficult to justify holding them accountable for the sins and failures of more powerful businessmen over whom they had no control. These could be the elderly or widows, even servants, whose primary motivation for investment was not speculation, but security. There needed to be some regard for, quote, the innocence of the average investor. The, evang the evangelical ideas of Chalmers gave way to the, quote, more optimistic liberalism of John Stuart Mill. Instead of retribution, he advocated the importance of, quote, a reputation for honesty in order to enable success on the market. This reputation, along with a system of registration and accounting to foster transparency and public scrutiny, would determine whether or not a business could be successful. The political economists advocated limited liability as a way of creating opportunities and dismissed concerns by suggesting that, quote, limited companies are harmless since no man is obliged to trade with one and no one will do so unless the company enjoys a good reputation. The market was still endowed with a sort of providential design, but with greater protections in place, it would become a site for the development of good character. Moreover, these enduring links to Christianity were important, as very few believed that, quote, market principles would automatically produce a morally beneficial outcome. In order to be successful, it was necessary to demonstrate a sort of integrity. And so this new morality was most important for the working classes themselves, who it was feared did not believe uh, in the laws of political economy. They, quote, have nothing in them of the timid, prudent, calculating spirit of the middle classes. In the early 19th century, it had been thought that the working classes should not be taught the, law, the laws of political economy, only that their characters might be improved in anticipation of their judgment by the market. However, the political success of Chartism precipitated a shift in this thinking. Working men should learn the laws of the market so that their characters might be shaped, up, shaped by it and thus prevent seditious uprising, um, as we saw earlier in the thinking of the Christian socialists. The sooner that they could see the workings of the market were beyond their control, the sooner they would abandon their revolutionary impulses. These aims are made plain in contemporaneous, contemporaneous works, such as John Lawler's Money and Morals. I think that's what I've got next. Mm. Sorry, apologies. I think I left out one of these quotes. Anyway, it's fine. Um, so According to Lawler, working men are impulsive, most evidently so in their politics, and socialism, as Lawler understood it, was delusional. In light of this propensity towards socialism and an intractable disdain for the middle and upper classes, it's necessary to, quote, anticipate and, and prevent any such movement by providing, if possible, channels into which the tendencies which would lead to socialism may find outlets, not only safe, but eminently beneficial. In order to do this, it's necessary to generate empathy between the working man and the capitalist. He must be made to understand uh, the capitalist position by practical experience. And so he says, working men, once enabled to act together as the owners of joint capital, will soon find their whole view of the relations, in, relations between capital and labor undergo a radical alteration. They will learn what anxiety and toil it costs to hold even a small concern together in tolerable order. What amazing difficulties there are in the, in the way of organizing by voluntary consent, that industrial discipline which capital, capital now enforces. 
and what losses, what cruel disappointments in markets, what trembling uncertainties may carry off the mind of the owner of capital in painful abstraction when the children are on the knee at the fireside or may whiten the hair on a sleepless pillow. Operatives who go through this experience will find not only their thoughts, but their sympathies enlarged, and they will grow in both wisdom and clarity. Moreover, and the importance of this will become more apparent later, it was considered by Lawler as well as others to be their right to have access to legal instruments that would facilitate this. On this score, he praises the Christian socialists who have caused, quote, a numerous body of intelligent working men to feel that amongst the educated and aristocratic classes are many of their firmest and most zealous friends. So the Christian socialists were, thus, uh, were then really instrumental in opening a wider conversation about limited liability as a means of enabling the working and middle classes to participate in the market. While there had been several attempts throughout the early part of the 19th century to introduce legislation that would enable joint stock companies to have easier access to limited liability, all of them failed. By the time it was taken up again in 1850, there had been no discussion of limited liability in Parliament for at least six years. The Christian Socialists found support in Parliament from the liberal, uh, from the liberal, uh, uh, sorry, little, the liberal MP for Shropshire, R.A. Slaney. Slaney was first and foremost a Christian philanthropist who saw, it as Christi who saw it as his Christian duty to, quote, improve the lot of the poor working men locked up in dark industrial towns. However, he was also deeply in influenced by an extensive reading of classical political economy, and he shared the Christian socialist disdain for Chartism. It was Slaney's view that social disorder was a consequence of parliamentary neglect of the working classes, and he thus advocated for a range of interventions from infrastructure and housing to welfare and education. In 1850, Slaney presented a motion to appoint a select committee to, quote, suggest a means for giving facilities to safe investments for the middle and working classes and affording them the means of forming societies to ensure the, themselves against coming evils. This provided an unlooked for opening for the Christian socialists to make their case for legal reform to support cooperative societies. The proceedings of the Select Committee on the Investments for the Savings of the Working Middle Classes followed the next in 1850, followed the next year by the Select Committee on the Law of Partnership, helped to further situate the legal rec recognition of cooperatives within a wider context of shifting views about the market and reinforce some of what I've already suggested. So the reports of both committees are at the intersection of two problems. One, unfair legal advantages accruing to larger, larger capital, which have the effect of excluding the working and middle classes from fair competition. And two, the rapid increase in population and wealth of the middle and industrial industrious classes and the need to quote, improve their condition and contentment in a way that would prevent injury to any class and provide security of welfare to all. In effect, these committees were concerned to democratize the market and in so doing, uh, transcend class antagonisms and the social disorder they were perceived to cause. As Donna Loftus observes, quote, capital was at the center of liberal visions of community in these debates. The social reform argument for limited liability imagined local communities tied together by capital investments, a potent example of mutual interests. In practice, however, they were primarily concerned with how the working classes could, quote, be initiated into the duties and responsibilities of citizenship through their engagement with a free market under the tutelage of more experienced men of capital. In this respect, the market was re regarded as a site of discipline for the working classes. Limited liability and the legal recognition of cooperative societies were a means of facilitating this discipline. The discipline of the market would be a moral one, as well as a political one for the working classes, diverting their attention from dreams of revolution and shaping them into responsible subjects. As the Select Committee report on the Law of Partnership states in summary, quote, it would be desirable to remove any obstacles which may now prevent the middle and even the more thriving of the working classes from taking shares in such investments under the sanction and conjointly with their richer neighbors, as thereby their self-respect is upheld, their industry and intelligence encouraged, and an additional motive is given to them to preserve order and respect the laws of property. These aims reappear frequently in the evidence presented to the select committees by the Christian socialists and supporters of cooperation, which emphasize the benefits of enabling the working classes to associate with their richer neighbors. As the Christian socialist Thomas Hughes remarked, quote, the great difficulty that the working classes have to contend with now is the want of competent persons to assist them in managing their investments. And I think that with limited liability, they would find persons to come forward and assist them. At another stage, Ludlow is asked, quote, whether limited liability would have the effect of inducing benevolent people who take an interest in the working classes to join them and lead them, 
to which he responds, I decidedly think it would. However, it was not just by virtue of the opportunity to associate with their social betters that the working classes would be improved. The experience of the market would both, both shape their characters and teach them the inviolable laws of political economy. Would quote facilities, as Slaney asked, given for such purposes within the law tend to, tend to foster habits of forethought and providence? To which Ludlow responds, I cannot say that I know of any more powerful means of increasing the security of the country. According to the evidence of John Stuart Mill, the experience of even a small number of cooperative societies would show working classes that the laws of the market were natural and that they labored by choice, not compulsion. There would be this great advantage that supposing those associations embrace only a small part of the working classes, they would have almost the same salutary effect on their minds as if they embraced the whole. The whole of working classes would see that all such disadvantages arose not from the law, but from the nature of the case or from the absence of the necessary qualities in them. Therefore, those who might continue to be receivers of wages in the service of individual capitalists would then feel that they were not doing so from compulsion, but from choice. And that taking all the circumstances into consideration, their condition appeared to them preferable as receivers of wages. In addition, it was argued that the mere provision of such facilities would help to dis disabuse the working classes of any desire to overturn the government. And so one more quote that says, I think it would enable them to ascertain by trial whether the ideas they have, and I believe they are very extensively entertained as the real means of bettering their condition can be carried out or whether they cannot be. At present, they may fancy that there is a paradise which would be very delightful if they could get into it. And if they think <laughs> that it can only be done by overturning the laws, they may just be disposed to endeavor, endeavor to do so. Further, it was not just the success of these projects that would be so beneficial, but their propensity for failure. When Slaney asked if their inevitable disappointment would quote, show, them, show that they were wrong in the idea that any injustice so far had been done, Ludlow responds saying, yes, it would promote their submission to things as they are. It would take nothing less than the tedium of a lived social ex experiment to reform the working classes. Their enthusiasm, as Lawler writes, quote, would probably bear any trial better than the trial of a socialist experiment itself, for it is very much easier to die on a barricade than to work for 12 months side by side with a lazy cooperative colleague and to see him regularly swallowing half of one's own earnings. So the act passed, of course, uh, but with some problems from the perspective of the Christian socialists. It was a disappointment to them that when the Industrial and Problem Societies uh, Partnership Act of 1852 uh, only offered very partial limitation of liability uh, to two years, sorry, only a partial limitation of liability to two years after a member had left the society. The Christian socialists were prepared, however, to soldier on without it. Notably, however, they accepted this less than satisfying outcome, not because they thought limited liability unimportant, but because registered companies also did not have li limited liability at this point. In other words, it was acceptable because they would be on a more or less equal footing with registered companies. The same principle of equality underlies uh, petitions for reform of the legislation in 1862. So in 1856, in the interim period, registered companies were granted limited liability. And this did not escape, I think, the, the attention of the Christian socialists or cooperative societies more generally. As multiple petitions to parliament on behalf of cooperative societies make clear, Cooperative societies registered under the 1852 Act, quote, labor under serious disadvantages as compared with other trading bodies. It was only fair that cooperative societies should also be bodies corporate with limited liability. This was remarkably uncontroversial, actually. These requests were granted by an amendment to the Industrial Pro uh, Provident Societies Act in 1862. Not long after, the absence of incorporation and limited liability could be regarded as mere anomalies in the original Act and how it always ought to have been. The law, as Ludlow writes, had now been made, had now, had now made it such that cooperative societies would have a chance of fighting their way in the competitive market with visors up and the law to back them. So what I've just given, I guess I would refer to as the kind of broader socio-legal context for the legal recognition of cooperatives. And I think it gives some insight into how this figured into larger debates um, and shifting ideas about the market, morality, and social order in the 19th century. Um, and again, of course, I don't think this is entirely determinative of what was happening with cooperatives, but I think it does say a lot about what legal recognition was supposed to do and where that was coming from. Um, enough, I think, to kind of warrant further scrutiny and to give us a bit of pause.
However, uh, my argument that legal recognition had a disciplining, and I'd say ultimately depoliticizing effect on cooperatives is not purely based on ascertaining the motivations and wider political context of those who pushed most for legal reform. My argument also has to do with regulation and the legal form itself, and the way in which this comes to be perceived in the mid 19th century. So as noted earlier, it was thought by, thought by some, sorry, oh, just a second, there we go. So uh, as noted earlier, it was thought by some that it was the right of working classes to have access to the legal recognition of their cooperative societies. This idea almost of a right to be regulated is at the very least a paradoxical one. It also reflects a particular set of historical developments and the ascendancy of political economy in the mid 19th century, which I'll come back to in just a moment. Um, and it's also quite a unique way of thinking about legal recognition that comes about in the, in the 19th century. So in addition to this, I think that the corporate form itself is important for us to consider. Far from being the working man's own creation, as the Christian socialist would later put it, the corporate legal form has a history that long precedes the 19th century. It extends back, of course, to the medieval church, before that to Roman law. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have time to discuss this history in any detail today, but suffice to say that the corporate form is a legal fiction, an abstraction of collective unity that historically has not been an obvious or natural way about thinking about human associations. Indeed, English law did not have a clear conception of the body corporate until the early 17th century. The first clear articulation of the corporation in English law is widely regarded to, to have come from Sir Edward Cook in the Sutton's Hospital case of 1612. There he wrote that a corporation aggregate of many is invisible, immortal, and rests only in the intendment and consideration of the law. Further corporations, as the 18th century jurist William Blackstone later writes, were formed for the public benefit and had to be authorized by the crown. The king's consent is absolutely necessary. What's significant about this early modern history of incorporation is that it's absolutely clear that the corporate form is a creation of law. Indeed, incorporation was a narrow public affair. Incorporation and the privileges associated with it could only be obtained through royal charter and later by specific act of parliament. It was not conceived of as a right, but rather a closely guarded privilege, sorry, it was not conceived of as a right, but rather a closely guarded privilege that the early modern state used in order to extend its power and reach across the globe. So for example, through colonial corporations such as the East India Company, domestically through major infrastructure, corporations and things like that. This dynamic uh, where the corporate form is actually very closely related to pr privileges granted by the crown uh, changed considerably in the 19th century with the provision of general incorporation by registration through the Joint Stock Companies Act of 1844. The provision of general incorporation by registration exemplifies one of the key tensions of political economy and what we might call liberal governmentality in the 19th century. Basically, this idea of uh, state intervention through regulations, uh, through regulation and increased regulation as a way of freeing the market. So uh, rather than freedom being laissez-faire, uh, it actually entails a great deal more regulation to create what we regard as the free market. In relation to working class associations, this kind of sort of paradoxical regulatory intervention where something is facilitative, but also controlling um, uh, had actually begun several decades earlier with the passage of the Friendly Societies Act of 1793. So this is a much more familiar dynamic, I think, for the working classes. So it's worth considering the context for the Friendly Societies Act in order to appreciate this mode of regulation. Friendly societies, as Alistair Hudson notes, Quote, were the first form of lawful structure permitted for working class people to form a common bond for their mutual welfare under English law. Following the French Revolution, the British, the British state had grown increasingly wary of associations amongst lower and working classes. As a manifestation of this apprehension, the Combination Acts of 1799 and 1800 consolidated a range of prior acts which were directed against any treasonable or seditious society. While the focus of these acts was on trade associations, or early unions, A.V. Dicey points out the fact that, the, that these acts included special provisions for societies such as the Freemasons and the Quakers and for charities, quote, betrays the width of their operation and the fears of their authors. Clubs of all kinds were objects of terror. 
Alongside this general ban and fear of conspiracy, the Friendly Societies Acts created a narrow permissive framework for the recognition of certain kinds of associations that were deemed desirable. However, friendly societies, it should be noted, were virtually indistinguishable from trade unions at this time. Friendly societies were uh, pro provided the social and legal basis for many different kinds of organization, including early cooperative societies. The recognition of friendly societies as a form of wel welfare provision became a means of separating desirable activities from undesirable activities. Desirable activities included those that helped to reduce government expenditure on the poor rates and encourage moral reform, while undesirable activities were strikes and other forms of political organization. Uh, as Gosden summarizes, quote, until about 1830, the idea of encouraging friendly societies to develop under the supervision of local justices with a view to relieving the demands on the poor rate can be seen in the legislation enacted. Proper supervision by the magistrates would eliminate any temptation to indulge in or to support illegal combina combinations or to help trade unions. In other words, the creation of a permissive or a facilitative framework that was paradoxically intended as a deterrent. The passage of this act, quote, was an example of the government identifying and classifying its allies to winnow out its, en its enemies. And I think what happens um, uh, as the 19th century progresses and the market comes to be an increasingly important determinant of regulation and regulatory intervention, the source of discipline is no longer accountability to the state selectively encouraging desirable activities while discouraging others, but the market by the state. And this can be seen as discussed previously in the discussion around limited liability for joint stock companies, whereby incorporation and limited liability would have the effect of exposing companies to public scrutiny. Although this entailed a greater involvement of law in company affairs, and in fact was not widely taken up when it became available, um, um, most companies didn't um, kind of uh, register under the new acts until much, much later. Um, uh, it was not necessarily perceived of or argued for as an increase in regulation. So one effect of the extended provision of incorporation by registration was that it came to be seen increasingly as a private right, rather than the narrow privilege it had been in the early modern period. The reform, as James Taylor argues, quote, was facilitated by and helped to perpetuate a reconceptualization of corporate privileges as private rights and of joint stock companies as private bodies. As a right, it was perceived of as natural and a reflection of the self-perception of, of the group rather than law. And so I think that this perception of incorporation as a right um, and as something that's reflective of the identity of the group itself masks the fact that its provision in fact marked a greater penetration of law in everyday life. And indeed, as we've seen uh, for cooperatives, their access to this legal form was also conceived of both as a right and is what they needed to, ha needed to have um, in order to have formal equality with companies. It also masks what I think is uh, not only a sort of generally homogenizing effect of legal recognition, making these entities sort of comparable and exchangeable in this created sphere of the market, um, but also as a form of enclosure. Um, and this is the thought that I'll end with, so I'm nearly there. Um, so enclosure, there's, there's a number of different ways to think about enclosure. Um, uh, in, in my thesis, I draw on a number of different theories. Um, I wanna just talk about it through uh, Carl Polanyi uh, and relate it to enclosures of land uh, for the purposes of this lecture. So enclosure is a term that in the context of the creation of the market usually refers to enclosures of the commons that occurred primarily in the 17th and 18th centuries. It describes a process of removal of land from the commons whether it could be shared, where it could be shared for activities such as grazing and foraging, and its placement within a regime of private property. For Carl Polanyi, the enclosures of land created, quote, a fictitious commodity from nature, which is itself emphatically not produced for sale in a market, unlike other commodities. As Polanyi says, what we call land is an element of nature inextricably interwoven with man's institutions. The enclosure and commodification of land were part of a wider process in which the market was disembedded from other forms of social relation, which were in turn subordinated to the principle, principle of the market. So I think the metaphor of enclosure here is useful for understanding the legal, recognitions, re legal recognition of cooperative societies, in part because it helps us to capture uh, what I would describe as a movement from what E.P. Thompson called the moral economy of the crowd and cooperative direct action um, as a process of disembedding. So I think it's important, and this is a kind of bigger part, uh, big part of, of the work that I've done for this thesis is thinking about 
in a sense, how to reorient in some ways how we tell the history of the cooperative movement. So, you know, of course, the kind of common trope is to start from the Russian pioneers and move on from there, from this modern form of cooperation. But of course, um, uh, the kind of ethos of mutual aid, uh, many of the practices associated with cooperatives uh, pre long predate the Russian pioneers, and I'm sure you all know that. Um, going back to, again, what E.P. Thompson called the moral economy of the crowd um, that are connected, I think, to much older forms of provision, older forms of law, and take that as the basis of ethos and association. Um, and then the form of association itself was not very closely governed until we get to the late 18th and early 19th century. And so in this sense, and to my mind, uh, cooperatives are kind of motivated by a sort of unruly resistance to the imposition of markets. And that's where a lot of it comes from in the first place. So I think one way of seeing what incorporation does is that it encloses this sort of moral economy, subordinates it to the market, providing a way for it to persist in a limited form without undermining fundamentally uh, the operation of the market economy, marshalling it to facilitate some of the discipline that reformers hope to achieve by securing legal recognition for cooperatives. And I think that this can all be taken for granted in a sense because of how we come to understand incorporation as a right and a reflection of reality uh, when we're moving through the 19th century. So all of a sudden, because you're accessing something that's a right, and we start to see the law as being kind of technically neutral, not necessarily imposing anything of its own, I think it's easy to miss potentially what happens through the process of incorporation and the kind of effects of this. And so by way of conclusion, I just want to say that this is not a problem that I think has an easy solution. Um, it's not as simple as saying, for example, not to incorporate and to instead choose other legal forms. The disciplinary effects of the market are much broader and more pervasive than particular legal forms. Um, so the disciplinary effects of the market are much broader and more pervasive than particular legal forms. However, I would argue that there's some benefit in regarding legal forms with a high degree of skepti skepticism and reflecting on the ways in which this history has shaped our thinking and our assumptions about what cooperatives are and what they should do in order to be successful. We not, may not be able to entirely escape the law, but we can define success and failure on our own terms and more thoroughly reject the logic of capitalist markets. We can challenge aspects of the law that inhibit our political imagination and our ability to create alternatives to capitalism, and we can use, learn to use the law differently and perhaps more strategically with an awareness of its inherent bias towards capitalist political economy. Um, uh, and we can reject this idea that uh, either way we must lose. So I'll stop there. <laughs>